Showtime Sports, the industry leader, known for award-winning documentaries, studio programming, and world championship boxing. But over the past decade, one thing has been missing, mixed martial arts. Tonight, Showtime celebrates the return of MMA. In 2007, Mixed Martial Arts made its premium television debut on Showtime. What was once an unsanctioned sport had crossed over to mainstream entertainment. Inside the cage, legends were reborn. Masters of the various fighting disciplines fought for championships. Stars came of age. Future Hall of Famers battled for their legacies. As the sun set on the first generation of MMA on Showtime, combat sports fans hoped and anxiously awaited the return. Wait no longer. The warriors of Bellator MMA have come to premium television. skilled array of athletes will usher in a new era. At the tip of the spear are many familiar faces. Some of the world's best fighters. Emerging stars. Rivalries. And the toughest tournaments in the sport. As these warriors target fans on a new platform. Tonight, we welcome back MMA to Showtime. has said on Good Friday at the Mohegan Sun Arena in Uncasville, Connecticut. But it's a new day in MMA with Bellator's first event of the year coming to you from the Fight Sphere on Showtime. And tonight we wrap up the semifinals of the $1 million Featherweight Grand Prix with the most accomplished fighter in Bellator history, Patricio Pitbull, defending the 145 strap in a championship rematch with Emmanuel Sanchez in the Bellator 255 main event. Hello there, I'm Mauro Ranallo. I was fortunate to be a part of the first MMA broadcast on Showtime, February 10, 2007. I am thrilled to be a part of the next chapter and I'm always over the moon when I get to sit cage side and call fights with a guy who, well, has done it all in the sport except fight. Big John McCarthy, welcome to Showtime, brother. Well, I could not be more proud to be part of Showtime, and thank God I was never fighting because I never would have been here. Well, two guys who know how to fight are Patricio Pitbull and Manuel Sanchez. It is round six tonight, John. What are the biggest differences you see in both the champ and challenger since their five-round encounter uh, November 2018? You know, there is differences, and the big difference between Patricio Pitbull is he's become even calmer when he's inside the ring. He doesn't force the fight. He lets his opponent come to him, and then he attacks. He counters beautifully. The big difference for Sanchez is he learned what he didn't know he now knows, and he has a confidence that he knows he can be in there with Pitbull. He can take his power. He just needs to change the attacks. Don't come straight ahead. Use those angles. Bring him into deep waters, and that's how he'll get his win. Patricio Pitbull has rewritten the Bellator MMA record book in his illustrious image. Meanwhile, Emmanuel Sanchez, well, he wants to run the division like cardio. His cardio is second to none. And you know what? He's got more cardio than the battery bunny. And on this weekend, he wants to steal the headlines 
from the Easter Bunny and secure the golden egg that is the Bellator Featherweight Championship. With more, let's go to Jen Brown at the Fight Desk. Well, thanks, Mario. It is great to be back at the Fight Sphere here at the Mohegan Sun Arena. And of course, we are all excited about Bellator MMA's debut tonight on our new home on Showtime. And what a treat we have for fight fans right out of the gate. It's a rematch championship fight. As we close out the semifinal round of the Bellator Featherweight World Grand Prix, we started with the 16 best featherweights in the world, and now we are down to the final three tonight. The Bellator's best pound for pound champ, Patricio Pitbull, will face the always exciting Emmanuel Sanchez to determine who will advance to the Grand Prix Finals. Now the winner tonight will face AJ McKee, the undefeated Phenom fighter, who just so happens to be joining us at the fight desk tonight. Welcome, AJ. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's fun to see you here in a suit all you know, joining us at the desk. Don't get too used to it, though. All right. And of course, we've got Josh Thompson, former two-time lightweight champ. Josh, and I know we've talked about this. It's pretty uh, surreal and kind of exciting to be back on Showtime. For yeah, you. a lot of my success was on this network here, and so it's glad to be back. I'm not in the cage, but this time I'm behind the microphone in front of the camera in this way, and I actually love it. I love it so much. And like she said, don't get comfortable. <laughs> That's right. Well, let's talk about AJ's road to the finals here, road to the goal. Uh, let's talk about the first fight, Georgie Karhadian. He called you out, and you answered back with a big knockout. Is that what you expected coming out of the gate? Definitely. You know, um, my, my entire warm-up for that fight, it was just surreal. I had OT Genesis in the back, Hoist Gracie came by, and so forth. So I had a lot of motivation going into that fight, and I said I wanted to make a statement. So finishing Georgie Kakarian, I, I, my goal was to go get the fastest knockout. That's not the fight that impressed me the most, though. It was your next fight against Derek Campos because you had to fight through adversity. At a young age, though, that was something that a lot of fighters or a lot of fans and critics were criticizing that you had never faced adversity really in the cage. That fight, though, you had hurt your knee in the first round. And just tell me exactly what was going through your mind after the first round. After the first round, the adrenaline wore off kind of in the second. And I told my dad, I'm like, hey, I, I got to get him out of here, you know, but Campos isn't an easy opponent to get out of there. So, uh, just picking my picking my strikes, being methodical, and, and waiting for that op opportunity to arise, and uh, I, I ended up seeing an opening, and I took it. Well, uh, tonight we get to find out who you will face in the finals. We've got Patricio Pitbull in a title rematch against the always exciting Emmanuel Sanchez. Uh, Josh, you know, when we look at Emmanuel Sanchez, there's a lot of words we can use to describe him, but the one that comes to mind for me is confident. Would you agree? <laughs> well, confidence is, comes from the cardio. He knows that he's probably got the best cardio in the game. And if he can push the pace, you can break any fighter. Look, old sayings like fatigue makes cowards out of everyone. That type of saying sticks around because it's true. And one thing he has never gotten is tired. And so when I look at him tonight, the, re the reality of it is that he really didn't lose that five round fight. This is just a continuation of that fight. And he's gonna continue at the pace that he left off. And we're just gonna see from round five to round six. Well, one thing he's also never been done is that stopped in every rematch he has won. All right, his opponent tonight, Patricio Pitbull, he's a two-time divisional reigning world champion. He was just named Bellator's best pound for pound fighter, AJ McKee. What makes Patricio Pitbull so good? Man, he's, honestly, he's probably one of the best fighters in the world. Um, I, I have nothing but respect for the man. He's, he's conquering goals and achievements that I've set for myself. So looking forward into this fight, you know, they both previously fought each other. They both know what to look for each other. So headed into this fight, I'm looking for what new things they have added to their arsenal for each other. But then at the same time, looking into the later rounds, I'd like to see what bad habits, what bad tendencies come out that they have already kind of gotten used to each other making. So it's going to be a good one. And then for Sanchez, you know, I, I expect Sanchez to go out there, keep the pressure, flurry him with the punches, and force, force Pitbull to force that takedown. Well, that's a really great analysis. He's got a million dollar vested interest in uh, tonight's main event. All right, that's it coming up later on tonight. But first, we've got more great fights coming your way in our co-main. We've got submission specialist Naaman Gracie taking on a former champ in Jason Jackson. And it's the Bellator debut of undefeated Usman Nurmagomedov, who will face Mike Hamill in a lightweight feature bout. And two heavyweights collide when Terrell Fortune takes on Jack May. But now, to kick off the night, an exciting women's flyweight matchup. Let's head back down to Morrow and Big John. Mo. All right, Jen, thank you very much. And we begin tonight's fistic proceedings in the flyweight division. Former Bellator women's flyweight title challenger Alejandra Lara takes on the undefeated Japanese judoka Kana Watanabe. 
And now, tonight's first fighter ready to make her way to the cage, Kano Watanabe. The 32-year-old Watanabe sporting her judo gi, the former rising standout, is well on a seven-fight win streak, undefeated, taking on Alejandra Lara here tonight. Uh, John, she has made her Bellator debut at Bellator 237 in December of 2019 in Japan. She has got incredible judo. It's the balance. You just saw in that takedown, the way she's able to hop that balance over to the point where she just puts enough pressure, her opponent can't stay on their feet. And once she's on top, Moro, she is super aggressive and goes after her opponent for the finish, and that's what she got in Japan, and that's what she says she's gonna do here tonight. She represented Ryzen at that event at the storied Saitama Super Arena. She is now under contract with Bellator MMA, and she has her sight set on the Bellator MMA women's flyweight crown. And now, her opponent ready to make her way to the cage, Alejandra Azul Lara. Twenty-six-year-old Alejandra Lara, a multifaceted individual, to say the least. Started reading psychology and philosophy books at the age of 12, was a hyperactive child. Her mother did not want to medicate her. They put her in karate, they put her in dance, and as you can see, she is enjoying her walk to the Bellator MMA cage, busting a move on the stage, and she's been busting more than moves. She's been, well, trying to bust up faces, showing a marked improvement in her striking, John, since she failed in her attempt to supplant then flyweight champion Alima Leigh McFarlane. And uh, let's go to see Lara in action. I'll tell you what, what we saw at Lara, this was from Hawaii, and this was her last fight against Vita Artiega, who we know is a brawler, a grinder. But it was the stand-up game that we saw such huge improvements with Alejandra Lara. She was sharp. She was picking Artiega apart with those shots. Nice kicks to the body. She was going through the full range of being an MMA fighter. And if she could do that tonight, she could stay at range and use that type of striking, she's got a great shot at winning this fight. She bounced back from a loss to the current Bellator MMA women's flyweight champion, Juliana Velasquez, winning her last two as we just saw highlights from her victory over Artiega. But you talk about an ambassador for MMA. She says this sport is much more than just breaking each other's faces. It's about showing that she's a martial artist who believes in honor, respect, and being a good example for the people who follow her career. I know a lot of people are going to follow the career of Alejandra Lara. She's just fun, but the tail of the tape on this fight, when you're looking at both of these ladies, they are outstanding fighters. Nine and three for Lara. 9-0 and oh with just one no contest, a fight that was stopped off of a foul. Watanabe has got no losses, and Lara wants to be the first one to put that mark on that record. Number four ranked Lara against the number five ranked Watanabe with the official introductions. Here's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome inside Mohegan Sun Arena for tonight's debut of Bellator MMA Live on Showtime. And now, inside the cage, the action gets underway with three five-minute rounds in the flyweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot six, weighing in 124.8 pounds. Her professional record, undefeated with nine wins, no losses, one draw, fighting out of Tokyo, Japan, presenting Kano Watanabe. And across the cage, her adversary fights out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 124.2 pounds. The former Bellator world title challenger enters with nine professional victories, three defeats from uh, Medellin, Colombia, introducing Alejandra Azul Lara. And when the bell rings, the referee in charge, Kevin McDonald. Back to your corner, back.
ready to fight? You ready to fight? Let's go. Referee Kevin McDonald calls for the bell. Alejandra Lara in the red gloves. Kana Watanabe in the blue gloves. And no feeling out process in this flyweight battle with so much at stake. And Lara already all over Watanabe. Nice by Lara back and off. She was holding her up with that left hand. Southpaw with the one two, but the takedown by the judoka. And this is where Watanabe, well, is the master of her domain. This is the place that Alejandra Lara did not want to end up underneath Watanabe and the strength of Watanabe. That's what you're going to be seeing right here. She's so good with her judo techniques, but she is a physically strong, strong lady. On the first MMA broadcast on Showtime in February 2007, the lady stole the show, Gina Carano versus Julie Kenzie. Only fitting that the females get to raise the curtain on the next chapter of MMA on Showtime here with Bellator and Watanabe all over Lara here in the opening minute of the first round. Lara did a great job of getting the kick and getting Watanabe's weight back, but then she made the mistake when she turned her back to her. Former flyweight champion, Alima Leigh McFarlane, and I gotta tell you, no fighting atmosphere like an Alima Leigh McFarlane fight in Hawaii. She is definitely watching with vested interest. Yeah. Why not be working to break Lara down? Lara trying to base out, get herself to a position where she can stand up. Lara's going to have to figure out, am I going to be able to get to my feet? This is a good job of getting right back up. And this is when she now says, I am a striker that believes in my skills. And I'll tell you, at the beginning of this fight, she was lighting Watanabe up with that left hand. The Southpaw Lara training in Mexico with UFC veteran Alexa Grasso. Two minutes now gone in the opening round, and Lara now trying to pick up the momentum, find a rhythm in the stand-up as Watanabe tries to take her down to the canvas one more time. Body lock trip, and this one, beautiful distribution by Lara into full mount, now has her back. What a beautiful transition by Lara to step over to get that mount off of the takedown. You saw double underhooks by Watanabe, but that was a beautiful reversal of positions by Alejandro Lara. Lara has two rear naked choke victories. Watanabe has never been defeated. Lara trying diligently to try to flatten out Watanabe. Watanabe doing a great job in not letting that happen. She is doing a great job, because right now, if you look at the hand position of Alejandro Lara, she's in a position where she's able to suck her hips back towards the hip area of Watanabe, and that's what's keeping her in place. A lot of energy being expended here as Lara looking to maximize this position on Watanabe. And what happens is when you have your hands in that position that Lara had, then they get oh, stuck high. underneath at times, and it takes you a while to work them out. Yeah, Watanabe looking for a backdoor escape, but it's uh, Lara with the hooks in. She's getting a little bit high. She's going back to that almost a seatbelt position, grabbing under the arms. Now she's too high. She should step off. Very smart. Coming up on the final 90 seconds of the opening round. Pivotal matchup at 125 pounds. Watanabe closes in, scores with a right hook behind the guard of Lara, but Lara really seems to be gaining more and more confidence with each and every outing in her stand-up. Absolutely, she is. You can see that. But she, one thing she needs to do, she's getting a little high when she's coming in. She's bouncing in and getting high. She needs to set down on those punches to make them have more effect. Watanabe fighting for the first time on American soil as they come together with less than a minute remaining now in the opening five minutes here with the fight spear left hand lands for Laura. With a nice right hand counter right behind it. So a frenetic start, beginning to settle down a bit as again Watanabe looking for the trip takedown. Lara doing a good job, delivers a knee up the middle. Lara trying to punch herself free. Very smart by Lara because you were in a position with the Judoka who when they're getting their hands on you, that's what they want and Lara is making her pay for it. Nice inside leg kick by Lara, final 20 seconds of the opening round here at Bellator 255. Thank you.
Good stuff from both Alejandra Lara and Kana Watanabe here to kick off Bellator 255. Here's the cop, beautiful inside leg kick by Lara, and then lights her up with that left hand, but gets a little over anxious, comes into her, which allows Watanabe to get her hands around her. But that was a beautiful combination by Alejandro Lara, and then Watanabe with the takedown, and that was a hard slam to the ground. Lara was not ready for that position. Beautiful trip over, and you see her stepping her leg over the top to take mount. And then a beautiful right-left combination right there by Alejandra Lara. Her stand-up right now is starting to take effect in this fight, which is going to give her, in my opinion, that round. Round two. Bell and round number two of this women's flyweight matchup. Alejandra Lara on her back foot as Watanabe comes forward. Lara trying to navigate the distance to land that one-two from the southpaw stance. Oh, she gets tagged with a right hand from Watanabe. Absolutely, Watanabe was landing a beautiful right hand there. And when we talk about the improvement of Lara striking, credit has to go to the, the Grasso family in Mexico for the work they've done with her job. Absolutely. Alexis Grasso and her father have done a really good job of getting her to calm down on her strikes. Oh, speaking of strikes, she just dropped Watanabe, seemed to be momentarily bothered, and the strike stats tell the story as Alejandra Lara lighting up Kana Watanabe and just landed a nasty knee. And those two elbows inside, those were strong and hard. Well, Lara's nickname is Azul, which is, of course, blue, and she says that uh, her blue fire will consume everything she touches in the cage, and she has been in fuego in her striking. And of course, picking up valuable learning experiences, back-to-back -back losses to the former champion, McFarland, and the current champ, Velasquez. And there's Ju Judoka using her bread and butter to bring Lara back to the ground where Watanabe is now inside control. Watanabe being on top. This is exactly where she feels comfortable and knows that if she is in this position, she can put heavy pressure down, keep her opponent in this position, and do some damage. Watanabe started her judo journey at the age of six, started to train to learn self-defense with her dad and brother, come from a family of martial artists, and now working from the back. Laura, nicely done, looking for the reversal. Looking for a leg right here. She has the leg entwined. And of course, you give, you, you put yourself up, at, you put yourself at risk, but you almost have to sometimes admire the, the, the risk-taking or the, the going for greatness as it is. Absolutely, and she's at less risk in this position than she was when Watanabe is going to be on her back. Although Watanabe looking for that potential arm triangle, but now has its side. Now she, right now, she's not in a position for the choke to work, but you can see that the pressure she's bringing down is still giving Alejandra some problems. She's got that arm trapped with the head, so she's not in a good position right now. Okay, guys, Well-rounded Watanabe with three knockouts and three submissions in her nine career victories. Nice elbow from underneath by Lara. That thing landed solid. Yuashim Hansen, the old pride fighter, was a nasty striker from his back as well. One of the few, right, that could generate some power from the back. That's all, well, reversal. Right now, you see that beautiful reversal by Alejandra Lara. She's in a half guard position, but she's got her head in a position. She can go for that arm triangle choke. It's a matter of, is that what she thinks that she can get? The arm is not in place, and you're seeing that Watanabe is now going for a Kimura grip. As expected, a highly competitive affair here between Kana Watanabe, the undefeated judoka from Japan, and Alejandra Lara. I'd like to see Lara step over the head and turn this around with that Kimura grip. 
Laura proudly representing Colombia. It's Watanabe looking for potential submission attempt here. Wow, right to Laura's back. Going right to the back from this position. Amazing. All based off of the Kimura grip and the threat of that setup, that reversal for Kana Watanabe. Laura was forced to submit to an Alima Lay McFarlane in her championship fight and now trying to defend against Kana Watanabe here with 45 seconds left in the second round. Right now, Watanabe, her right arm is being secured by Alejandro Lara. She's got a baseball grip on that, knowing that if I keep that in position where I have it, I'm at least going to be safe from the submission of the choke or anything like that. Trying to flatten out, Lara does so. Lara turning over now, eating some of these right hands from Kana Watanabe. Nice job of movement by Lara. Get her out of that position. See Juan not be trying to stick on the back, but she's a little bit high. She's going to go for the arm right now. Stop! Stop! Release. Let go. Beautiful movement right here. Check out the elbow as it lands. Look at that nice elbow inside by Laura. And again, that one was solid. It's those things when you're in tight, putting your hands in that grappling position, you can be struck. And that's what Laura was doing. Here is that elbow I was talking about from the bottom. Kind of grazed, but it did, you know, touch Wanami and makes her think that I've got to be careful in this position with what she's throwing. But right now, with that back position, you can see. Lara changing her position, trying to turn. Watanabe landing some big shots. I do believe right now, Moro, we're looking at an even fight. Let's go. Well, this crucial matchup at 125 pounds could potentially be hanging in the balance in this third and a final round. The bell goes, they touch gloves. Lara in the red gloves, Watanabe in the blue gloves. Lara from the southpaw stance, started karate at the age of four. So both of them beginning their respective martial arts journeys young and Watanabe walking into the strikes of Lara. And that was a beautiful left, straight left hand by Lara landing. And you're seeing that she's getting smart about when Watanabe's trying to put her hands on her, she's not only pushing away, she's starting to circle out of it. Adjustments you would like to see both fighters make here in the final five minutes, John. One of the things I'd like to see with Lara is I want her to think about her footwork when she is striking. She's getting herself, she's starting to crush that distance on herself. You don't want that to happen. And with Watanabe, she needs to be accurate right now in her takedown effects. When you get these opportunities, get your hand on your opponent, do not let them pass by. And she did it. Very nice job by Watanabe. Takedown again by Watanabe into the close guard of Alejandra Lara. A minute and a half gone here in the third and final round. Alejandra is good off of her back, but she needs to now at this point try to at least stop, control the arm, control the position, open up the guard, put her feet on hips. You can't sit there with a closed guard holding on to your opponent for too long. This right now is exactly where Watanabe wants to be, Moro, because she's going to be winning here. She's landing the heavier shots. As time goes by, this is good for her. Laura's got to be the one to say, okay, I got to get on my horse and start to really move now. 
Watanabe wanting to remain undefeated, move one step closer to an opportunity at the flyweight championship currently around the waist of Juliana Velasquez. You know the likes of Ali Malay McFarland, the former champion Liz Carmouche, Denise Kielholz, and others would love to get that 125 crown, but here to kick things off at Bellator 255, Kana Watanabe maintaining top position on Alejandra Lara after a very competitive and a rather even opening 10 minutes on your unofficial scorecard. You have the fight even, but Lara's got to uh, start to Dig deep. She's gonna have to do something because you know Watanabe has moved herself into a half guard position. She feels very good here. She wants to stay in this position. Look at the figure four that she has on the leg. That's telling you I want to hold on to that leg. And she's just systematically hitting her with strikes. All the points are just adding up in her court. Where else have we seen that figure four? Around the, uh, the legs where you neutralize. Uh, uh, there was a guy in all time greats. Yeah, some guy named Nurmagomedov. Oh, quite a bit. Nice segue, by the way. We've got a uh, Nurmagomedov coming up here on Bellator 255. Usman Nurmagomedov, undefeated, much anticipated debut against Mike Hamill. But right now it's Kana Watanabe looking to remain unbeaten, and she continues to smother Alejandra Lara. Yeah, absolutely. This is right now. Lara's got to go. She's got to say, you know, I'm going to lose this fight if I don't take a big chance right here. So take the chance, go explode, make her have to really work to stay on you. But right now with that figure four in that leg, she's stuck. And yeah, that's it. She is trying. Kana Watanabe has her tied up in knots. Less than a minute remaining in the third and final round. And Watanabe feeding some left hands to the face of Lara. Just continuing to well, mother her, almost full, guard, almost full mount right now. We're looking at what we call three quarter, I mean, quarter guard or three quarter mount. All she got to do is get that leg free. Foot's right there. 30 seconds left in the fight. And Watanabe continues to be a weighted blanket on Laura, but. Lara not feeling very secure. She's in trouble. Here's Watanabe going for the choke. He is going for the choke, putting a lot of pressure on that. Lara's going to in the judo takedown again here, keeping Lara on the canvas. Lara doing everything she can, just not strong enough to get away from Watanabe. What a fight for Watanabe, especially in that third round as she controlled Alejandra Lara. They go the distance to kick off Bellator 255 on a Showtime, showcasing the level of competition at 125 pounds, John. Man, you, you take a look at that fight. Both of those ladies came out. Lara came out really strong in the first round, but it was the last two rounds that Watanabe was able to utilize her judo to take control of that fight. This was the start of the fight. Beautiful wow. kick, beautiful left hand. Got a little bit inside. This is a great combination, but ends up being taken down on a beautiful outside reap of that leg. And it was the judo of Wanabi. Look at her stick to her like there's Velcro on her. She's able to stick to her. Lara hurts her, but Wanabi in the end, heavy hips, heavy pressure, heavy strikes. It was her judo background that gave her the ability to get what I believe is going to be a unanimous decision victory here in this fight against Alejandro Lara. All right, checking out the fight stats for our first fight of the night, and you see how competitive it was, John. Well, it was Except in the takedowns department. There you go. Where it, and that's where the fight the ended up, and that was the difference in the fight. Mixed martial arts. It's everything. And you know, a lot of those strikes you're looking at, you know, if you look at those strikes, they look close. Lara landed probably the better stand-up strikes and the heavier strikes. A lot of Watanabe's were on the ground but it's all that ground activity that ended up giving her the, this victory. Let's find out who wins our opener here tonight. Let's go to Michael C. Williams.
Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Brian Miner, scores the fight 29 28. He sees the fight for Lara. Your second judge, Michael Bell, scores it 29 to 28. He sees the fight for Watanabe. Your third and final judge at cage side, Sal D'Amato, scores the fight 29 to 28 for the winner by split decision. Kano Watanabe! That was one beautiful fight by Kano Watanabe. I do not believe that the judge that gave that, that, that actual fight on his cards to Alejandro Lara was looking at that the right way. It was Kano Watanabe that deserved this victory. That was a beautifully hard fought battle. Congratulations to Kano Watanabe. The eagerly anticipated Bellator MMA Light Heavyweight World Grand Prix gets underway next Friday night on Showtime as current heavyweight title holder and former 205 champ Ryan Bader Just like that. gets another shot at Lyoto the Dragon Machida. The quarterfinals continue Friday, April 16th. Corey Anderson, fresh off his victorious debut, welcomes Dovoljan Yagshimuradov to the Bellator MMA cage. And the belt is on the line in the main event. And it's all over! As Phil Davis looks to avenge his split decision loss to light heavyweight world champion Vadim Nemkov, who is riding a seven fight win streak. The opening round concludes with a bang Friday, May 7th, as Bellator newcomers Anthony Johnson and Yoel Romero collide with a spot in the semifinals on the line. The Bellator MMA Light Heavyweight World Grand Prix starts next week on Showtime, where warriors rule. The Elite Eight getting ready to get it on. The Light Heavyweight World Grand Prix begins next Friday right here on Showtime, and this just in. Coming up Friday, May 21st, the main event will see the return of Chris Cyborg as she defends the Bellator MMA Women's Featherweight Championship against Leslie, the Peacemaker Smith. And this is a rematch, five years in the making. Leslie, the first time you took on Chris Cyborg, you thought the fight was stopped prematurely. How are you going to try to right that wrong May 21st when this time you have the ultimate prize that's on the line? It's a good question. Luckily, I've had the past five years to work on it. I've also been in this camp already for a couple of months. I'm ready for anything. I've been training all aspects of my game. Leslie Smith, the challenger, Chris Cyborg, welcome to Showtime. This is where you broke out as a fighter. And Friday, May 21st, you get to defend the Bellator MMA Featherweight Championship. What kind of statement do you want to make May 21st? You know, five years ago, I'm going to do my best. I love my job. And I'm just going to do what I love to do, you know, do my best and be ready for everyone to step fight with me. All right. Let's bring the uh, champion and the challenger in. Little meeting of the uh, minds. Get a little face off here before we get set for what will be a Bellator MMA Women's Featherweight Championship match. It's coming up Friday, May 21st. Cyborg versus Smith. The rematch this time for the Bellator MMA Women's Featherweight Crown. All right, let's go back to Jen Brown. Well, thanks, Maura. Looking forward to seeing both women back inside the Bellator cage. And speaking of rematches, tonight's world title fight between Patricia Pipple and Emmanuel Sanchez is a rematch of a very close title fight the two had back in 2018. Now, Patricio was able to hold on to his belt that night, but tonight, Sanchez says, will end differently. I want to prove that I'm the best. I know that if they think that guy's the best, I'll go out and take him out. If they think this person's the best, I'll go out and take them out. Short or tall, big or small, they all will fall. Ever since I was a little kid, I just always wanted to be a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> Growing up in the 90s, you know, in Jackie Chan movies, I always wanted to be able to do all that stuff. So I'm excited that I'm able to learn it, 
teach it and live it, and martial arts is my life. There was a teacher who always told me it's not just about being a black belt in the gym and on the mat, but a black belt in life. So I just watched my idols like George St. Pierre, BJ Penn, Chuck Liddell. A dream was born with hard work and dedication, and that discipline and patience, and you can turn your dreams into reality. And there's nothing that I wanted out of MMA more than being a world champion. The Bellator Featherweight World Grand Prix so exciting for the fighters is because there's so much on the line. In this format, there is no ducking, dodging, picking and choosing when you want to fight or who you want to fight. During this election show, when I saw that Daniel Beitschel had picked February, I knew I wanted that fight because when this tournament started, I knew I wanted all the guys who beat me first. Daniel Beitschel had taught me my first valuable lesson. I knew I had to get that one back, and I did. Sanjay! This is the matchup. Semi-final number two, Emmanuel Sanchez facing us against the champion and for that featherweight title, Patricio Pitbull. We cannot wait to see this fight. If it is anything like the first one, John is exactly right. He can not wait. In the first fight, Daniel finished Pitbull in the first round. Oh, he just got rocked with that though. That hurt it. I know that he's such a great fighter. With all that amount of experience that he has, all that he's been able to accomplish, I thought he'd be a lot harder to hit. He taught me a very valuable lesson that day, and now I'm looking forward to show him what he taught me. Watching him fight these last three fights, I still see those holes and those openings that those other fighters couldn't capitalize on because those guys aren't me. I definitely bring a style that I know he can't keep up with. When I got into this game, I just knew I never wanted to be that guy who got tired. I wanted to be nonstop, in your face, pressure everywhere, standing around the ground, and not stop till I finish you. What an impressive win! I want it now! Who wants to see me fight for the bell? To even get into the final eight, then into the final four, you can't write a better story than that. You gotta believe in your greatness. Never hold nothing back. So I'm going out, avenging my losses, and coming out to uh, the Bellator Featherweight World Grand Prix champion. All right, well, we see Emmanuel Sanchez there talking about rematches, avenging those losses. He's never lost a rematch, by the way. When we talked to him this week, Josh, he said that the biggest difference that he feels is his confidence coming in. He says that he knows now that he can beat Patricio Pitbull. You've been in a rematch or two. What is it like to have that going and knowing you've already stood across from the guy you're about to face? What does that do for you in terms of confidence? Well, he's already beaten Daniel Weichel, who he's lost to. And now Patricio's the next one on the list. And that's exactly how he had planned to line this up. Look, a lot of things that his confidence come from is when he fought Daniel Weichel the second time, he picked and chose his shots, hit to the body, hit to the head. He had a lot of nice work that he did to the body work, but that's not the most impressive thing that he has done throughout this whole thing. You talked about his grappling and how much better it's gotten. Yeah, his grappling is a big key, I feel like, and uh, a lot of people kind of underestimate it. So with this fight, I think he just needs to flurry Patricio, keep the flurries going, force him to shoot. If he gets the takedown, then let, let his ground game open up a little bit, you know? He, he's very comfortable off of his back. Well, you know that Patricio likes to control the center of the cage. Sanchez is a pressure fighter. Uh, how can he implement his game plan tonight, Josh, without leaving himself open to some of those situations that we saw got him into trouble in their first fight? He's got to fight him the same way he fought Daniel Weichel. He's got to just stay calm and composed, walk him down slowly, and not jump in with big shots. If he does that, he's got a chance tonight to beat Patricio Pitbull. All right, well, that is our main event. It is coming up later on tonight. But first, our co-main event, it is an exciting lightweight matchup. It is the Bellator debut of the undefeated Usman Namagami. Now he is taking on uh, Mike Hamill. Now, Josh, you are you're familiar with Usman. You uh, you rolled with him. He trains out of AKA. Uh, I'm curious. We know about his last name. It's very famous. He's got a very famous cousin that we all know. But how different is he than his cousin who will be in his corner tonight in Habib Nur Nurmagomedov? So Habib and him are completely different. They have nothing really in common other than the fact that they have very vicious ground and pound. But it's stylistically on the feet. He's completely different. He has more of a Taekwondo style stand up. Okay, he uses a lot of kicks. He's good with the long range punching, but he is vicious on top. A lot of his takedowns don't come from the double leg takedown. It comes from the body clinch, like his training partner, uh, Islam Makachev. So they have similar styles in terms of the ground and pound, 
But really what it comes down to, other than that, their last name, that's all that they have in common. Well, his opponent tonight, Mike Hamill, says that he knows that this is the biggest fight of his career, but he is hoping uh, to make a big statement with an upset win over the undefeated fighter tonight. Will he be able to do that? Guess what? We're going to get that answer right now. Moro, back down to you. All right, Jen, thank you very much. Usman Nurmagomedov making his much-anticipated Bellator MMA debut. He's 11-0. He meets the gritty magic Mike Hamill in lightweight competition. And now set to make his way to the cage, magic Mike Hamill. And now ready to make his way, Usman Nurmagomedov. Representing the Dagestan hey, brother, Dynamos, hey, the ubiquitous Nurmagomedov name in MMA, John, and Usman Nurmagomedov, who turns 23 on April 17. His cousins with, well, the greatest lightweight in MMA history, Abib Nurmagomedov, but he brings his own flavor to the cage. He does bring his own flavor. And what you're looking at, Moro, is, you know, we have a, a Gracie and Naaman Gracie later on tonight, but you're looking at the newest dynasty. The, Nur the Nurmagomedovs are incredible. You're looking at, Habib was 29 and 0. You're looking at Usman, he's 11 0. His brother is 13 and 0. These guys do not lose. Our tail of the tape for this lightweight matchup. It is all about, look at that record, but look at the age of Usman Nurmagomedov. This is a very young man. Mike Hamill's in the prime of his condition right now. We'll see if the 22-year-old can pull off another win. Here's Michael C. Williams. Bellator MMA moves now to the lightweight division set for three five-minute rounds live on Showtime. We introduce the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 155 pounds, even as a professional. Seven wins, four losses by way of Green River, Wyoming. He fights out of Phoenix, Arizona. Magic Mike Campbell. And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner. At 5 foot 11, weighing in 155.2 pounds tonight, he makes his Bellator debut, bringing an undefeated professional record of 11 and 0, fighting out of Mahatskala, Dagestan, Russia, introducing Usman Nurmagomedov. And the referee in charge, Todd Anderson. Todd Anderson, the third man inside the cage. Mike Hamill fighting for the first time at 155, looking to upset the undefeated Usman Nurmagomedov. And there is Usman's cousin, Habib hey. Nurmagomedov, hey. who, hey. as dominant as he was as a champion fighter, he could be one of the great trainers in the sport as we kick things off here. Nurmagomedov is in the red gloves and Hamill taking the fight to Nurmagomedov immediately in the blue gloves. This is exactly what I expected out of Mike Hamill after watching him in his debut against Adam Borges when he came in on less than a week's notice. 155 is the weight for Mike Hamill. He's got energy, he's got a lot of gas, and he is a guy that just keeps coming forward. He is gonna put pressure on Usman. How is Usman gonna respond to it? Nurmagomedov 
with an 11 and 0 record, 10 of those wins inside the distance, seven wins via first round knockout or submission. He's only fought past the second round once in his career. And all five of his previous wins have come via knockout or submission. Question mark kick there by Nurmagomedov. Now from the southpaw stance with the left hand, John. Both of those landed. Actually, they got touched as far as they were blocked a little, but they still had some snap on them. Javier Mendez, who of course has trained a murderer's row of champions at AKA, was blown away the first time he saw Usman Nurmagomedov train on his mats. You know, the first time I watched him fight, I was like, dang, man, that kid is so good at the stand-up, so calm, so relaxed, and he just keeps coming. And his wrestling is outstanding. He just doesn't like to wrestle. He likes to stand up and throw his hands. And Mike Hamill bringing the fight to Yep. Nurmagomedov made up, standing right in front of him, bouncing up and down, trying to disrupt Nurmagomedov. made up, but Nurmago made up very calm, cool, and definitely connecting with those kicks. That was a beautiful spinning back kick, and that hit Hamill to the body, and you could tell that it actually had effect. And you see the the, the calmness of Nurmagomedov, meanwhile, Hamill trying to make it as frenetic as possible. Yeah, you can see right there, you know, Hamill did land to the body. That was a nice thing. And Hamill is taking chances trying to get inside on the range of Nurmagomedov. Current Bellator lightweight champion is, of course, Patricio Pitbull. He'll be busy defending the featherweight title in our main event tonight in the semifinals of the $1 million featherweight Grand Prix in a rematch with Emmanuel Sanchez. As we have reached the midpoint of the first round, Nurmagomedov stabbing Hamill with that jab. There's a right hand by Hamill, but the counter kick by Nurmagomedov. The thing to look at is every time that Mike Hamill comes in, see the fact that Nurmagomedov responds. He makes him pay for coming inside. He's going to give him something to think about on every entrance. Timed it perfectly with that right hand jab a couple of times, now going low with the kicks. Staying at range, Hamill trying to come in and load up with that left hand. The left hand over the top, it touched him. Hamill just rushing a little bit. He just needs to use your footwork to slide yourself inside. He's pointing to the ground, trying to get a little disruption in the flow of Nurmagomedov. I don't think you're going to be able to uh, get a Nurmagomedov off their game that way. A minute and a half remaining in the first. Nurmagomedov with the pace and the space, John. Yeah, he, he's really doing a great job of just answering that question. Every time Mike Hamill steps in to, to you know, ask a question, Switches. he gives him an answer. And he just switched stances there, landed, uh, partially landed a head kick, partially blocked by Hamill. Hamill closes in, lunges in, and misses wildly with that right hand before switching back to southpaw stance. And Mike Hamill, a lot of energy being expanded. And I, and I can tell you, Mike Hamill is Under a minute, He has taken a lot of body shots and he continues with the pressure, so that's telling you he's in shape because that takes a lot of your gas away. He is looking for that home run with the left hand as he got tagged on the nose with that stiff jab from Nurmagomedov. 40 seconds left here in an entertaining opening round. Switches stances does Nurmagomedov. What a beautiful, steady diet of body shots by Uzman Nurmagomedov. And they're looking for the takedown before. And again, exiting. exits with that kick. Final 20 seconds of the first frame. Hamill again misses with the wild right. Inside leg kick by Nurmagomedov. Nice start to this a lightweight matchup between Usman Nurmagomedov and Mike Hamill. Look at the different kicks that you're going to see from Usman Nurmagomedov here. Beautiful brings that question mark kick up high after going down low. Again, up high to the head. It was making him pay all the time. Beautiful spinning back kick to the body. A leg kick right here down low. You can see it's hard, moves Mike Hamill's base away from him. 
just making Mike Hamill deal with something. He's not sure what's coming or which direction it's going to come from, and that starts to make you hesitate. Here comes the kick up high towards the head. It touches. It doesn't have any power behind it. He ends up losing his balance. But an unbelievable display by Nurmagomedov of just switching his attacks up and down and all around. OK, out to go. Thank you. Give me a towel. Give me a towel. Start to yell someone, right? Ready? Ready? Hey! The bell and round two, and again, Mike Hamill explodes out of his corner, meets Nurmagomedov in the center of the ring, and eats that body kick. And uh, again, Nurmagomedov going upstairs with the kick blocked by Hamill, but then manages to land the jab to the sternum. Beautiful low calf kick by Mike Hamill. He needs to continue to work at landing that shot. Hamill definitely pressuring Nurmagomedov. Madoff. Brought in a nutritionist as he's got his head popped back with that jab. Trying to make weight the right way after having issues again on that short notice fight against Adam Borch. And Adam Borch again, one of the top fighters on the Bellator MMA roster. And he fought a beautiful fight. He lost a split decision against the guy coming in. You know, on that week's notice. Yeah, he was missed weight. What do you expect? Here, the feints, the, the chess match that's unfolding here between Nurmagomedov Madoff and Hamill. What did you like most in the opening round as they uh, look to exchange here? What I loved and what I saw out of Uzma Nurmagomedov again was it was the variety of tags. He was going up high, he was coming down low, he was going to the body, he was using kicks, he was using a jab. He's got a arsenal of attacks and he uses all of them, which keeps you off balance. What about Hamill? He continues to come forward and Hamill looks for the takedown on Nurmagomedov, Nurmagomedov, and so Mike Hamill pulling out all the stops, Joe. That was a nice takedown attempt, but again, he did not get it. You know, you saw Nurmagomedov's hand hits the ground, but he's right back up. And what you're seeing out of Hamill, what I do like, he continues to bring the pressure. He's continuing to try to vary his attack, but he's got to take chances at coming inside. And right now, when he is taking those chances, we're seeing that Nurmagomedov is making it painful. Yeah, Nurmagomedov painting him with kicks. Two minutes gone in the second stanza. Hamill doing whatever he can to try to get Nurmagomedov off his rhythm and uh, can Nurmagomedov kick it? Yes, he can, John. 21 of 43. Total strikes landed all in favor of Nurmagomedov. Hamill misses with the left. Nice body kick by Usman again. Very impressed with the fact that Mike Hamill taking all of this damage, but it has not slowed him down. He keeps on trying to come forward. He's trying. He's looking for his attacks. And yet, Nurmagomedov Madoff at the same even composure, John. Very efficient, very economical with his offense. Now, the one thing that you're starting to see a little bit more from Mike Hamill is he's starting to lean. He'll bring himself in with his feet a little bit, but he's leaning forward, which is then making his withdrawal slower, which is going to give Usman the ability to hit it more. Under two minutes left in the round, Nurmagomedov Madoff started with Muay Thai and then trained in wrestling. He says he likes to strike more than wrestle, but he says it's no problem if you want to take it to the mat. Well, he's content to keep it in the stand-up where he is getting the best of a Mike Hamill. And yet Mike Hamill remains a gamer. That jab just keeps on peppering Mike Hamill right in the middle of his face. It's stopping his progression coming forward at times. It's a beautiful tool. And that may start to in inhibit some of his breathing. He's been moving a lot, expending a lot of energy, and now blood on the face of Mike Hamill as Nurmago Madoff continues to pick him apart at his own speed. Just look at the combination of those kicks. That was a beautiful kick with the left leg of the body, and then brings that ball leg straight up to the sternum. Moves his head out of reach. There's that body kick by Nurmago Madoff. Leap right and the head kick. And again, 
goes after the takedown, threatens the takedown, and then ends it with the kick, making you pay. It's just a beautiful exhibition of all around striking skill. Mike Hamill having a hard time breathing out of his, through his nose, so his mouth is open now. Final half minute of the second round. Magomedov painting Hamill's face with his own blood here in the final 20 seconds now. And again, the stiff jab lands beautifully for Namaga Madoff. The jab is getting nasty, Moro. Switches to orthodox, back to southpaw. And right there, just, just take a look at the angle as he circled out on that. Just a beautiful exhibition of what a defensive fighter will do. Now we just start running all his micros to some blitzes. You know what I mean? He's doing a good job with his range and his jabs. He's only catching you down the middle. Only shots yeah. he shouldn't do down the middle. That's it. Head off that center line. Here's Usman. Mike Hamill trying to take it up down. He gets it down to the ground. Hands hit the ground. But he's right back up. Nice jab. Slips the right hand. Beautiful going right back to the jab. Jab is really starting to make a difference. There's a beautiful straight left hand. You see Mike Hamill taking a swing with the miss. It has been the execution and accuracy Three, four shots. of Usman Nurmagomedov that is really starting to take a toll in this fight on Mike Hamill. Let's go, out, 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 out. Number three. The bell and the third and final round underway in this lightweight matchup between the undefeated Bellator MMA newcomer, Usman Nurmagomedov, and Magic Mike Hamill looking to even his Bellator record at one and one. Mike Hamill doing the right thing by bringing that pressure forward. Just keep yourself a little, when you step in, do it off center, don't go straight in. And Mike Hamill has thrown that left hand over the top. Elbow from Magomedov 15 times in this fight. I don't think he's landed one of them before. And yet, he stays in the pocket. He stays in front of Nurmagomedov, but he has to make adjustments. He has to differentiate in there, changes levels, looks for the takedown, and tenaciously tries to get it on Nurmagomedov. Nurmagomedov posting. Let's start to work here, Mike. And Hamill has Nurmagomedov's back. That was a beautiful transition by Mike Hamill, using his hands to set up that takedown, changing levels. But again, he's unable to do anything with it. He gets to his back position, but not able to control the position. Nurmagomedov back on his feet, back to peppering the jab, throwing the knees, and the kicks. With some lemon pepper on that jab. Minute and a half gone in the final round. Hamill's corner exhorting him. Magomedov finishes that combination with a body kick. Avoiding doing a good job defensively and not overdoing the job, just moving out past time. Mouthpiece is on the canvas. Put it in. That's too that, The whole thing is there's not a lot of wasted motion from Nurmagomedov. There's a lot of motion, but it's not wasted. Ammo continues to throw double jab in the left hand from the southpaw stance. You also have to think how much respect you have for Mike Hamill. Yeah. He has taken a lot of shots, and he is still in this fight. He is still trying to win it. He is still coming forward. You got to be impressed with this guy. He is a fighter to the core. 28 year old out of Green River, Wyoming. And again, searching for the takedown. Dogged determination by Mike Hamill. <laughs> Will he be able to create some magic in the last half of this, the final round? Oblique kick. 
That kick was blocked. Yeah, but that hurt the oh, and blocked. Yeah, that drove the whatever air remains out there. Now it's Nurmagomedov piecing up. Hamill with that combination. He got hurt by that body shot. That's why you're seeing him back off. He's got to gain some space. It's there. Under two minutes left here in the final round. Jab by Nurmagomedov, and again the takedown attempt by Hamill. Let's see if he can make this one successful. Delivering short knee strikes. Now has Nurmagomedov's back with a minute and a half remaining. What kind of magic can Hamill conjure up? He's trying to pull it off right now. Nice job of getting back to the feet by Usman. Another oblique kick, counter body kick by Nurmagomedov. Okay, that landed cleanly. Windmill right hand misses for Hamill. There's a lot of blood on both fighters here, Paul, but it's only coming from one of them. Final 60 seconds. Hamill again misses with the windmill. Nurmagomedov touches him with the jab. Take a look at that kick stat right there. 36 of 68. My God, that's a lot of production. And Hamill again. The wrestling family from the University of Wyoming still searching for a takedown. Still being gritty, still being tough, still going after the win. 30 seconds left in the fight. Hamill continuing to bring the fight, but he's getting countered effectively by Nurmagomedov. It's Hamill bringing the pressure, but it's Nurmagomedov doing the damage. That's exactly it. He's being a beautiful counterfighter. He's utilizing that pressure to work to his advantage. And now, you got the end. beautiful strike right there. That hurt. And Hamill looking to put an exclamation point on his gritty effort. With that jumping knee, but for Usman Nurmagomedov, as good as advertised, John? Absolutely. <laughs> Moro, if you are not impressed with that performance based upon what Mike Hamill was bringing his way, you are not liking MMA. That was outstanding. <laughs> Let's take a look at these highlights here. Look at the body kicks, and it's really, look at all of the transitions from one technique to another. It was Usman landing body shots, going to the head with the jab. All of these strikes adding up. Mike Hamill putting a lot of pressure, really trying to close that distance on Usman. It was just those kicks and the body strikes that Usman was landing. Look at that kick to the body, man. That, all I can tell you is that hurts. Look at the stats here. 73 strikes landed to 36. Morrow, take a look at those kicks right there. 38. 38. You know what that's Boy like to get time. kicked 38 times? <laughs> no, thank you. I got kicked once by Boss Rutten. Once. <laughs> uh, a tremendous effort for Usman Nurmagomedov. And again, we look forward to seeing what he has in store in the Bellator MMA lightweight division. But for Mike Hamill, we go to the judges' scorecards, but this is the type of fighter you, you want to have on your roster, John. He was in the deep end of the talent pool tonight. Oh, my God. You're taking a look at a guy, you know, you can count that Mike Hamill is going to come to fight, and that's all you can ask of a guy. He came out there, gave everything he had, was always trying to win the fight, was never being a guy that was just saying, okay, I'm just going to try to last in this fight, defend myself. He was always being offensive. you got to love that guy. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, after three non-stop rounds of action, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Doug Crosby, scores the fight 29 to 28, while judges Sal D'Amato and Michael Bell both see it the same, 30 to 27. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Usman Nurmagomedov. A beautiful and brutal Bellator MMA debut for Usman Nurmagomedov. An early birthday present. He turns 23 on April 17, improves to 12 and 0, 1 and 0 in Bellator. Congratulations to Uzman Nurmagomedov. He just proved why he is still an undefeated fighter. And Habib Nurmagomedov, his cousin, 
celebrating with him. And there's Javier Mendez of American Kickboxing Academy, San Jose, California, producing the likes of not only Habib Nurmagomedov, but Cain Velasquez, Daniel Cormier, Luke Rockhold, an embarrassment of championship riches. Boy, I tell you, you look at the champions that have come out of AKA, we're, we're talking guys like BJ Penn also, and even our own Josh Thompson there, Mr. Morrow. Absolutely. Josh the Punk Thompson involved in still to this day my favorite trilogy one and one ever. well two of the fights took place on Showtime against Gilbert Melendez let's go to Jen Brown I remember those fights very well Moro hey that was a great statement fight there by Nagamadoff looking forward to seeing more from him inside the Bellator cage all right, spring is here, and that means it is fight season. This April and May, we've got an incredible lineup of combat sports coming your way only on Showtime. Now it starts with a one-two combo next Friday and Saturday when Bellator MMA and Showtime Championship Boxing are on back-to-back -back nights. We've got the light heavyweight tournament. It kicks off on Friday when Ryan Bader goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the dragon Leota Machida in a highly anticipated rematch. And then Saturday, undefeated welterweight Jerron Ennis meets the former super lightweight champion Sergey Lipinets on Showtime. Time championship boxing. Then on Friday, April 16th, the quarterfinals of our light heavyweight Grand Prix continues with two monster showdowns. Vadim Nemkov takes on Phil Davis and Anderson meets Yashi Murdoch. Then Bellator returns May 7th as we conclude the light heavyweight quarterfinals when Anthony Rumble Johnson takes on Yoel Romero plus a world championship fight between Bantamweights, Juan Archuleta and Sergio Pettis. And just announced tonight, May 21st, we've got Chris Cyborg defending her featherweight belt in a rematch against Leslie Smith. All of this coming up on Showtime, your home for combat sports. All right, all the fight action. It goes down in the fight sphere right here at the Mohegan Sun Arena in Unkinsville, Connecticut. Now still to come, our main event matchup, the champ champ Patricio Pitbull faces Emmanuel El Matador Sanchez in a highly anticipated rematch. Now, Patricio Pitbull's resume is unparalleled, and when you look at the history books, it's no surprise that he's basically the main character. Now, Pitbull is Bellator's winningest fighter. He is number one pound for pound in Bellator. Those rankings just came out. He is a champion in two divisions. He is tied for most knockouts, and he is currently on one of the most impressive runs in Bellator history. This is Patricio Pitbull. Fighting is the only thing I know to do. For me, this, this is everything. Chandler gets rocked by Patricio Pitbull, and Patricio Pitbull has done it, makes Bellator history. When I was young, my father realized that I fought a lot in the street, and they, he came to me and, hey, stop with that. I'm going to put you in jiu-jitsu. And jiu-jitsu gave to me the discipline. I am a little smaller than anyone in the in the gym, and I was very violent. My coach looked at to me and, and said, "Hey, now you are pitbull." When I start to fighting in Bellator, it was a dream, and I still enjoy it. So I still live in my dream. And putting an exclamation point on the fight. Everyone wants the gold, so the gold is with me. If they want the gold, they have to beat me first. It's not gonna happen. My first fight against Emmanuel Sanchez, I remember that it was a violent fight. Emmanuel Sanchez is very good, he's very dynamic, I like his style. But he, he's not better than me. This time I'm going to finish him early. I don't want to do a war again. You gotta love what he just did right there. <laughs> Fuck yeah. As a champion, the tournament is more difficult for me. I have to prepare for a title defense, like five rounds, and it's bring me a lot of injuries, but I'm doing the smart game on the gym and uh, take care of my body, and I think that's the secret. Boom! It's MMA, Big John! Competing tournament like this is about uh, your mind. It's not how good you are, but in your mind it has to be like a rock. When I won the Grand Prix, it, it's me, I'm pound for pound. I'm gonna win this fight and win the tournament. I don't care about the money. It's my legacy. The poster boy for Bellator MMA, Patricio Pitbull, getting ready to defend the title again against Emmanuel Sanchez in our main event, the semifinals of the $1 million featherweight Grand Prix. 
coming up, a battle of the big boys and at the weigh-in, well, Tyrell Fortune, Jack May getting along like dogs and a vacuums, and Jack May <laughs> wanting to make it a dog fight tonight. Tyrell Fortune, Jack May run it back after a no contest the first time around. Chapter two is next. And now we welcome to the cage, the outlaw, Jack May. Now Jack May's nickname, John, is the outlaw, but did he miss an opportunity here with Jack M. M. May? I think he did, man. When you said that, I was like, well, wow, I wish I had thought of that. He was uh, screaming May Day after what went down in their first fight. Let's take a look as Tyrell Fortune landed one. Well, south of the... Uh, south of the equator. Yeah, the yes. demilitarized combat zone. <laughs> that, was a, that was a strong knee to a place where you don't want to need to land. And it was enough to make it to where Jack May was unable to continue on in the fight. I don't blame him for it. That was a, a vicious blow. And he says he wants to make Tyrell pay for that blow here tonight. Former basketball player, I think he'd be a good fit with the Bad Boys Pistons. He's got a little Bill Lambeer in him. There you go. And now, his opponent, Tyrell Fortune. Tyrell Fortune he is nine and a one with that one no contest against Jack May. All of his professional fights have taken place in the Bellator MMA cage. After opening his career with eight consecutive wins, he successfully rebounded from a two fight winless skid in November when he beat Saeed Swoma at Bellator 251. Yeah, he's one thing about Tyrell, let's just be honest. This is a guy who came from a wrestling background, but he has got power in his hands. He is an athlete, he is fast. And when you take a look at heavyweights, heavyweights all can hit hard. But it's can they wrestle and how fast are they? And Tyrell Fortune has got both. Our tail of the tape for this fight, it's as simple as it gets. You can take a look at the height. Six foot two for Tyrell Fortune, six foot eight for Jack the Outlaw May. But moral, when you take a look at the reach, it is exactly the same. All right, let's go to Michael C. Williams. Get Mohegan Sun Arena live on Showtime Bellator. And that may now features heavyweight set for three five minute rounds and we introduce first the blue corner at six foot eight weighing in 264.3 pounds his professional record 11 and 7 with one no contest fighting out of Whittier California the outlaw Jack May wow. And across the cage is adversary, fighting out of the red corner at six foot two, weighing in 251.2 pounds as a professional. Nine victories, one defeat, and one no contest originally. From Portland, Oregon, he fights out of Phoenix, Arizona, presenting Tyrell Fortune. In charge, your referee, Dan Merliata. Dan Mergliata, your referee for this heavyweight rematch here at Bellator 255. Tyrell Fortune and the 6'8". Right. Okay, you ready, sir? May. You ready, sir? Let's go, round one. The bell in round one, Fortune in the red gloves, May in the blue. May was baptized by conflagration when he went to CSW with Eric Paulson. First guy he had to train with was Josh Barnett, and there's Fortune taking May down immediately, John. And this is the real difference when you were taking a look at both fighters coming into this fight. Jack May can fight and stand up. He's got power in his hands. He understands how to be a good stand-up fighter, but the wrestling game of Tyrell Fortune is just leaps and bounds ahead of what Jack May is capable of performing at. Yeah, he began wrestling in the third grade, did Fortune. Was an NCAA Division II national champion. 
Grand Canyon University, second runner-up at the U.S. Olympic trials and working to take May back down to the canvas. Hey, we want that over. Yes, get it over his head. Minute gone here in the first round. Keep those hands forward. Keep that leg. Keep that leg. Jack May at 6'8", same right height hand, as former it. UFC champion Tim Up, Sylvia. Right There's been 7-1, Sammy Schilt, heavy, heavy. the 6'10", yes, Stefan Stroop there again, McGee's, right but hand, fights hand. here he's he's in tough against Fortune, John. He's in tough up, against Jack. Fortune. Fortune's doing all kinds sure. of things just to create problems for Jack May right now. Beautiful inside, pulling the leg out. This is where you Round need to be in pound. trouble, especially as a heavyweight. When you get a guy that's postured over the top of you and, and is able to engage those hips in throwing those bombs down on your head, you've got to move, you got to get out. Good. Relax. Elbow there. Push your face away. Elbow. Smother the face and elbow. Jack, get up to that right hand. We're coming up. I'm over the top. Fortune, right number six in the Bellator MMA heavyweight rankings. Current heavyweight champion, Ryan Bader. He'll be a part of that stacked light heavyweight Grand Prix that begins next Friday. Good. Nice short elbow by Fortune. You know, what happens more all, all the time when you get guys like Tyrell Fortune that come from a wrestling background, are national champions, are on the world team. They come into MMA, they learn their stand-up, and some of them right fall in love that right with that stand-up, the and that's all they want to be is a stand-up right fighter, and they stop wrestling. And when you stop wrestling, you stop the ability to engage in a wrestling match because there's a different type of cardio that it takes to be a wrestler instead of a stand-up fighter. We are past the midway point of the opening round. Tyrell Fortune and his wrestling background paying dividends here against Jack May, working from left, top Jack. position, feeding him some left hands. May trying to block. We got to move. We got to move. Big heavy Jack, shots. Got got steady move. diet of right hands from Tyrell Fortune. And Jack is not doing anything to change what's occurring here. Fortune favors the bold, and it's Tyrell Fortune. Brazenly attacking Jack May. May shelling up. Elbow. Jack May is doing nothing to get out. It is just May a day, of a May day. That's it. And that go. is it. Tyrell Fortune improves to 10 and 1 with one no contest. And he records his sixth knockout win. There's still bad blood between these two. And you, you look at what occurred. Tyrell Fortune here just put a beating down on Jack May. Jack was unable to stop anything once that fight hit the ground. No, I don't. Let's take a look at this takedown here. Change of levels, grabs the single leg, just turns the corner, which puts May down on his butt. Jack tries to pull himself over towards the cage, but doesn't get in a position where he can get up. And right here, we're talking about, you know, three-quarter mount, yes, and Elbow. he's just opening up with that right hand. Elbow. Just jackhammering it up and down, that's going to elbows. elbows. Let's go! Talk that shit down! Tyrell Easy. Fortune basically, you know, calling out Jack about what was being said in the weigh-in, and both still not actually wanting to be friends. No love lost between uh, Tyrell Fortune and uh, the oh, yeah, outlaw yeah, Jack May. May pleading his case that he was hit to the back of the head. In any event, the referee stops the fight, and uh, it is a victory for Tyrell Fortune. And he let out of a, a lot of emotion. He really wanted this one. He wanted to finish the unfinished business with Jack May. And, he did just that. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, referee Dan Mergliata steps in, waves off the contest due to strikes officially. Three minutes, 16 seconds into round number one. The winner by TKO Tyrell Fortune. Tyrell Fortune was supposed to face Matt Mitrione, but instead he made Jack May pay. Let's go to Big John. Tyrell Fortune, you came out in this cage, you had a nice little movement, and then you went right into grabbing a single leg, dragging him to the ground, and utilizing a ground and pound attack. Was that your idea from the very beginning? 
Uh, not really. You know, I just wanted to play it by ear, see what he was going to give me. He was stepping in a lot, so the takedown was there, so I took it. This fight, for whatever reason, you guys don't seem to like each other. There was a little bit of animosity. We saw it when you were kind of jaw-jacking it with each other at the weigh-in, and then it kind of continued in here tonight. What's with all the animosity? Uh, when I was fighting Saeed, he was messaging me constantly, just talking shit for no reason. You know, he just kept coming at me, talking mess, and it was just, like, unnecessary. And uh, we finished it here. You did finish it here. You are now 10 wins into your career here. At the level that you're at, where do you think you should be in who you're fighting next in the heavyweight division? I want Moldovsky. Moldovsky? Moldovsky's in front of me. I want to get him. He's very similar to you as far as build, stature, wrestling ability. Might be the close. He's kind of ooh, fast. I wouldn't say all oh, that. I think you're you giving on, him man. a little too much. <laughs> wrestling ability, skills, ooh. I think you're giving him too much. Well, I want to tell you, that was an outstanding effort right there. You dominated that fight. Congratulations on your 10th win. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Thank Tyrell you. Fortune. Tyrell Fortune picks up a victory here at Bellator 255, and uh, we are going to go once again to Jem Brown. Well, thanks, Mauro. Bellator's launch tonight on Showtime is just round one in our fight season schedule next weekend. Showtime Sports returns to the Mohegan Sun Arena for a blockbuster two-night event. Now, Friday, it's the greatest light heavyweights on the planet's turn for that $1 million World Grand Prix prize. The tournament kicks off when Ryan Darth Vader meets the dragon, Leota Machida. Then on Saturday, April 10th, Showtime Championship Boxing returns with a triple header event when rising star Jerron Ennis faces the toughest test yet in Sergey Lipinets. It's a can't miss weekend live next weekend, only on Showtime. All right. Coming up next, it is the battle of the welterweights. We've got former LFA and Titan champ Jason Jackson taking on submission specialist Naaman Gracie. Now, when we talked to Jason Jackson this week, Josh, he says, look, I know how to beat Naaman Gracie. He says, I need to keep this fight on my feet. I need to keep my back off the cage. And I need to stay basic. What did he mean by stay basic? Well, everyone thinks they know how to beat Naaman Gracie, but keeping it basic, though, honestly, is the right way. The game plan should be put the jab in his face and keep him at distance. If he can keep it that basic, he can win this fight. And that's really what it comes down to, using the push kick, using the jab, making sure he never punches his way into a clinch and putting himself in jeopardy of being taken down. Well, we look at his last fight when he fought Benson Henderson. Josh, you know how good Benson Henderson is. It's very hard to look good against Benson Henderson. He pretty much dominated him. What did you think in that fight? What impressed you most when you saw that? Well, he stuffed every takedown. Benson Henderson tried to get a takedown. He was relentless with the ta with chasing the takedowns. Benson Henderson didn't get any takedowns. And Jason Jackson stayed on top of him, pushed the pace, went to the ground with him when he needed to, and then came back up to the feet. He did exactly what he needs to do tonight. He needs to put that jab in the face and make them respect the distance. Well, he uh, says that he feels like he is in the prime of his career tonight, but he does have a tough test ahead of him in naming Gracie, a submission specialist. Obviously, the Gracie name, very synonymous in this sport. We know what that means. But when you talk about his style, it's not what you expect when you think Gracie is it, Josh. No, his style is definitely leaps and bounds above all the other Gracies that came before him. Now, that's an evolution of, of the Gracie name as well as the, in, the, in the sport. The one thing about him, though, is that he's elevated his game, not just from the, from the feet and the ground, but he's put it all together better than any Gracie has ever done before. He punches his way into the clinch. He doesn't jeopardize shooting the low-level takedowns. He actually punches to the clinch, to the body lock or the double unders, forcing himself to really get out of being any threat on the, on the feet. He has great. He does a great job of getting the takedowns from the clinch, and when he's on top, he obviously dominates everywhere because of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Well, would you say that he is the uh, most, I guess, complete Gracie fighter to date? Oh, hands down, absolutely, and, and that's just because of the evolution of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, as well as him being in the sport. He's. This is what he loves to do, and this is what he's wanted to do. He has done a wonderful job at evolving the Gracie name into this sport of MMA. Well, yes, he has. All right, well, when you are a fourth-generation Gracie, it's a little hard not to submit to the life of jiu-jitsu, but it doesn't mean you can't try. Team Gracie! When your last name is Gracie, your destiny and career path are pretty much determined for you. Just like that! And the finish goes to Gracie. My uncles are fighters. My father is a fighter. Even my, my little cousins, everybody in my family is a fighter. So I have no choice, man. I try to be a soccer player, but I'm so bad at soccer that it didn't work out, you know? 
but carrying the esteemed name of the first family of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu on your shoulders is a burden that does not weigh down Neiman Gracie. I never felt pressure because since I was a little kid competing in Jiu-Jitsu, I got to learn how to deal with that pressure. So I taught myself how not to feel it and how not to let it be a trouble for me. The Gracie's already proved what we came here to prove. With Jiu-Jitsu is the best martial art against martial art. Now the only thing to prove is that I am the best fighter in the world. Now that is tight. He's going to go off. Forced to tap out, and the Gracie train keeps rolling. My game plan is always Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. My fighting style is like a lion taking down his prey and choking him and finishing up, you know? Whoever is there in front of me uh, better be ready. The next man in front of Gracie, a fighter who's known as the ass-kicking machine, Jason Jackson, an up-and-coming welterweight who would like nothing more than to knock off MMA royalty and put himself on the title track. But Gracie's near-perfect record of finishes has him supremely confident. I won my belt! All my wins, but one, it's all by submission. And that's what I'm looking for, is to showcase uh, jiu-jitsu. I think I'm doing that pretty well. That being said, my main goal is to be a world champion and have that belt around my waist. And I think I'm gonna get it pretty soon. Well, both uh, Naaman Gracie and Jason Jackson hope they get a championship opportunity soon. But right now, they face each other in this important welterweight encounter. And now, making his way to the cage, Jason, the ass-kicking machine, Jackson. Well, the pride of Spanish town Jamaica has been stirring it up in the Bellator welterweight division. Jason Jackson, since making his short notice debut against Ed Ruth and taking the former wrestling standout to a disputed split decision. The ass kicking machine, well, Johnny's booted a trio of tough tushies. His three fight win streak includes the biggest win of his blossoming career when he spoiled former oh, yes. UFC lightweight right champion Benson Henderson's guy. return to the welterweight division last December. And we've talked already about what a win could mean for his promising career. He's got a song in his heart and a well, a couple of fists to do some damage. Oh, he talks yes. about his fists, and I will tell you right now, Moro, he is on a three-fight win streak. I honestly believe that that win streak should be a seven-fight win streak right now because I do believe he, he got, as we would say, robbed of a victory by the judges in one of his fights. And so I'm looking at a guy, Keech Kunamoto, great submission game. Jordan Mead, a super tough guy I've known since he was a kid. Benson Henderson, world champion. And Jason Jackson made short work of all of them as far as they didn't have a shot in those fights. He is a guy that is right now on the top of his game. He's fast, he's long, and he does have good submission defense. So we'll see what happens here tonight. Ready now to make his way, Neymar Gracie. Eric B and Rakim, you can't go any better than that. And you will, well, you'll be forced to sweat Naaman Gracie's technique, John, because uh, he started the family business at the age of four. And you know, there are secrets like the Cadbury milk one that may never be revealed, but if you're a member of the first family of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, the Gracie's game plan, never secret. Wrap your opponent up like a chocolate bar and make them down. Yep, and you're absolutely so right. But Naaman Gracie does it differently than the other Gracies. The other Gracies, for the most part, they're looking for arm bars, they're looking for chokes. So does he, and he loves the chokes. But this is a guy that will absolutely attack the legs, and he is outstanding at his leg lock game. And he's working on his striking now at King's MMA in California under Rafael Cordero as we go to the tail of the tape. Absolutely. Take a look at those right there. Great records on both, but there is a big reach advantage right now for Jason Jackson. And with that jab, he needs to utilize it to keep Gracie off of him. 
number three and number six in our new Bellator MMA welterweight rankings. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Bellator MMA now presents the co-main event three, five minute pounds in the welterweight division. Live on Showtime, we introduce the blue corner. At six foot one, weighing in 170.9 pounds. Impressive as a professional, he brings 13 wins, four losses originally. Hailing from Jamaica, he's fighting out of Hollywood, Florida, the ass kicking machine, Jason Jackson. And across the cage is adversary, fighting out of the red corner. At six foot, weighing in 170 pounds, even the former world title challenger, who's near perfect as a professional. He brings 10 victories, just one defeat, fighting out of Newport Beach, California, by way of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Introducing Neymar Gracie. And your referee, Kevin McDonald. Kevin McDonald oversees this important welterweight contest. Naaman Gracie, Jason Jackson, set to throw down for an opportunity to move another step closer to a potential title shot. Let's go. Current champion is Douglas Lima at 170. We have Jackson in the blue gloves. He holds a victory over Lima's brother in the regional circuit. And of course, Gracie in the red gloves challenged then champion Rory McDonald for the title. Bounce back with a victory over John Fitch. And Gracie trying to swim in with those strikes, trying to close the distance to try to get the clinch and potentially force the takedown. Jackson's not having it thus far, John. Oh, landed a beautiful shot and circled out, keeping his back off the fence, and then went right back to that low calf kick on that lead leg of Damon Gracie. Jackson said his mission is to finish Gracie as he catches him with a one-two. He wants to make a statement. He wants to show everyone that he deserves to be fighting for the title. His last five fights have gone to the judges. Jason Jackson landing a very heavy right hand multiple times now. He's setting it up with that jab. Four of his 13 wins have come via form of knockout defense. The takedown against Gracie. And plants a right hand in Gracie's face as now Jackson momentarily in top position. Beautiful escape by Gracie right into back control and right into the hook. Something went very strange there. It was almost like Jason Jackson stopped. I don't know what it was, but he was in a position on top and all of a sudden. Well, he's on the verge of being stopped here. But you're right, John. It almost seemed like. There is oh, he's talking to him. Let's injury. listen in, John. Let's listen. There is some type of injury that occurred. So Gracie continues to fish for the submission, but obviously something has transpired here in the opening round. And Jason Jackson in trouble here, John. Yeah, I really don't know what it is. I can't, I can't start this unless... I think he's saying he can't see. I think that he actually, when he went on top of Naaman Gracie, I believe that his le the left side of his face got basically cheese gratered by the fence, and it has affected his vision. And that's exactly what happened, John. And now, a compromised Jason Jackson needs to somehow try to defend this submission attempt from Naaman Gracie. As ominous as it gets when you're in a position like this against the Gracie's, and it's obvious that Jackson's got issues. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And you're looking, you, you hate to have a fighter get injured by something or running into the fence. Uh, I don't know how bad his eye is, but it was obvious that he just stopped well, fighting. Stop trying to revert. Stop. Time. Time. Okay. I'm going to let the doctor take a look at that. We'll go back to this position if he can continue. He's complaining about his eye. What's so good? just stand over there for me. 
Name it. All right, here we go. This is what we're looking at. You right. see Jason Jackson on top. He's good? Yeah. And okay. Name it tries to move his You see right there where his face goes into the fence and kind of just rakes down on that chain link. He's going to continue. Yeah, they wait, wait. <laughs> restarted in full mount with wait. You ready? Ready time? Fight! With Gracie employing that head and arm momentarily as uh, Jackson trying to somehow reverse his fortunes here. Two minutes left in the opening round. Well, what happens with that moral so everyone understands is when Jason oh, gets hurt, by nice reversal by Jason Jackson, but when Jason, thought, John. when Jason gets hurt, he's hurt himself. It wasn't, there was nothing illegal done by Naaman, so it becomes what we call a fair blow. So it's not like that Oh, they're going to stop the fight and there'll be a no contest. He would lose the fight on a TKO if that fight was stopped. And yet here he is now working in the uh, closed guard of Naaman Gracie. Get out there. Big right hand handed by Jason Jackson. And you see he's still, he's still pawing at that eye. Still causing a problem. Swing from uh, MMA legend to hoist Gracie as Jackson taking Naaman Gracie to the canvas. Jackson's just a little bit upset with everything that's occurred, so he's taking it out right now on Naaman. That was a beautiful, sweet kick in the legs out of Naaman Gracie. And there's a calf kick by Jackson. Gracie misses and just... So does Jackson. Yes, barely a minute left here in the first round. This is the normal type of takedowns that you see Nevin Grayson going for. He gets the body lock. Takedown by Jackson. Jason Jackson, who's overpowering. Naaman Gracie with these takedowns. Jackson started training MMA at the age of 19. One of the things, if you want to consider it, more, Jason Jackson fights out of Sanford MMA. There's a guy named Rory McDonald who is the only loss on Naaman Gracie's record. That's his training partner, so at least he's got a good idea of what Naaman does when he's on the ground. Breathe a little bit for me. Yes. Water's here. Water's here. Take it. Here we go. You can Focus. see what occurs Focus. Focus. with this little it. motion right now. All of a sudden, Jason Jackson's face gets raked, and you see it getting pulled onto that chain link. That was the cause Ross of the damage. Ross has come through everything. No problem. A strange situation, but something he's going to have to fight his way through. Hey, keep it pumping. Behind the line, please, man. Thank you. The bell in round two. Jackson in the blue gloves. Gracie in the red gloves. Jackson comes out firing. How do you have that eventful opening five minutes on your unofficial scorecard, Joe? Well, it's a weird round to score because I gave it to Damon Gracie based upon he got all those positions. He did some damage on top. He went after the submission. But if it wasn't for that raking in the face, which caused all that, I would have given it to Jason Jackson. He's the guy that did the better work for the times when he was actually fighting and that incident didn't occur. You wonder now about his peripheral vision on that left eye as he brings the fight to Gracie, moving forward, flashing the jab, fainting. There's a cat kick by Jackson that lands with authority. And he's been very effective with that low cat kick. He has landed that several times. Oh, goes for the knee. Gracie cinches the takedown, immediately puts in one hook, jumps on the back. Jason Jackson just physically very strong. 6-1. 
A 30-year-old with a record of 13 and four. He's four and one in Bellator. Looking to lace a Kimura grip on that arm of Gracie just to make it to where it puts Gracie in a position where he has a hard time deciding where, where he's gonna go to. He can't get it right now. Gracie just leaning on that body, making him try to carry that weight. Nice digging of the underhook. Good job by Jason Jackson to dig that underhook and turn him. Yeah, on Gracie, pinned him along the fence. Now Gracie's still holding on. There's the exit, Gracie with a calf kick on the exit. Jab from Jackson. Gracie throwing the right hand. I have to wonder how much that left eye is you're bothering Jackson, but he still just remains as game as ever. Well, and you can see that there is some swelling around the eye, but the real question is, what is the vision of that left eye? Is he seeing blurry? Is he not seeing at all? Still to come, the main event, the semifinals of the featherweight Grand Prix. Patricio Pitbull defending the 145-pound championship in a rematch with Emmanuel Sanchez. The winner will defend the title in the final against undefeated A.J. McKee. And that's all still to come as they run it back. Right now, Gracie controlling Jackson along the fence. Jackson getting to his, well, to his knees, trying to get back to his feet, being neutralized by Gracie. Yeah, Naaman right now has got a good position with his hands around the lower hip area or upper leg area of Jason Jackson. So he's just kind of just hanging out there, and Jason's just kind of hanging out too. Naaman normally gets his takedowns from those body lock positions, and that's how he got it off of a tilt to get Jason to the ground. We're gonna see what he can do with him at this point once, while it's down here, though. Jackson told us that he didn't want to give up any position, didn't want to give Gracie anything, wants Gracie to do something out of his comfort zone. But here with a minute and a half left in the second, Gracie controlling Jackson along the cage. Uh, he's not only controlling Jackson, you see he's legs. slowly and systematically getting that figure four on those legs to control those legs so that he can now put pressure on Jason Jackson, the Gracie family taking a page out of the Nermagamadoff book. Thank you very much. Don't let him hook. Don't let him hook. Hide your ankle. Jason, it's one minute. Keep going, man. Don't Under a minute left that. here in the Don't second round, and really a bit of a stalemate. Gracie needs to improve position as well, John. He's just holding you punch in the face. Yeah. Nothing much happening here. Not a whole lot. Gracie right now is he's just trying to wait for Jason Jackson to make the move so he can try to take the back. Or move towards a mount position. He he should be reaching out. You see that hand on the ground there, Moro? He should be reaching out and taking that away because that way he could drive Jason Jackson to his back. Yes, keep punching. 50 seconds. Gracie continues to try to tie up Jackson's legs. Final 10 seconds of the second round. Stop. Hey, you good for that. It's no, no lazy shit. You throw a lazy knee, you got taken down. Keep your hands sharp. And just keep your feet moving. The guy's gonna fall all over himself. Yeah. Just keep dancing on this stuff. You only keep your dumb because you threw a knee without your hands on in the middle of the cage. When I mean center, I mean in the center. Não pode pensar em você. Ele tá morto. Pode derrubar. Não tem certo. Ele tá assustado com o tiro. Vou pressionar ele porque ele morreu. Vou botar ele contra o queijo. Vou botar pressão para esse cara para baixo. Só não deixa ele ficar te levando para casa. Porque ele quer isso aqui para você. Não tem isso. Entendeu? Ela já morreu. É tua, bicho. Essa porra é tua. Tu vai ganhar agora. Quando eu falar para tu levanta a cabeça e joga o quadril, tu vai cair montado, porra. Now David is getting beaten up in the corner by his cousin Enzo. Enzo Gracie headlined the first <laughs> MMA event on Showtime February 10, 2007 against Frank Shamrock. And yeah, 
all-star corner with Enzo Gracie and Rafael Cordero. And meanwhile, Jason Jackson, who's had to endure that left eye injury, begins the third and final round, flashing a jab as Gracie goes downstairs with that low calf kick. That jab is something I think if Jason Jackson wants to win this fight, he needs to start really pumping that jab. Make him and have a problem with it. Make him try to come in where he can land a big shot. Double jab by Jackson, unable to find the range, but there's Gracie avoiding that cap kick. Get away from the cage. Get away from Very the cage. patient. Nice job of saving Gracie. Yep. Circles away from Gracie's forward momentum. Jab lands for Gracie. Single shots, though, John, here in the third round. Well, both guys, you know, are working. They, they put a lot of energy out at this point. But it's Gracie's the one. He's just trying to push it towards that cage. The spinning back kick that lands for naming Gracie. Don't see too many of those coming <laughs> Gracie. Not too many. He's working with Cordero. A little overextension there by David. Solid jab lands for Jackson again. Jackson planting the jab and a jab from Gracie. Jackson misses with a wild right. He can double up on that jab. He's already having a problem again. Jason, do the chest. Separate. Look at me. All right. Go stand right here for a minute. Jason, in the center. Just watch out. There was one quick push where your fingers went out. Stay right there, okay? Jason Jackson saying that he got kind of raked to the eyes. I'll take a look. Call the doctor in. Or we get back to it. Yeah, fingers went right to the eyes. Right. Hey, Doc. That's his one good one now. Is it time to bring in the Pride Fighting Championships gloves to <laughs> MMA in North America? Well, the first eye injury had nothing to do with the gloves. That yep. one right there was just basically that push off. Come on, man. But when that's your only good eye right now in your fight, you're saying, well, I need it. You see the, the jab lands to the left eye a little bit, but it's that poke right there to his right eye. That's what he is having a problem with now. We good? All right, stay back for me. Wait till the doc's out the cage. Ready time. Three minutes remain in this fight. Both Gracie and Jackson looking to move up the rankings. Gracie looking for another opportunity at buying for the welterweight championship while Jackson looks for his first championship opportunity and look at the total strikes landing. Yeah, the, the, the total strikes when you look at 73 for Gracie. Jackson coming into beautiful job, stopping the takedown, getting top position and no fence to cause an injury on his eye in the middle of the cage. And now Jackson with Gracie on his back. Let's see what Jackson could do to improve his position and make life difficult for Naaman Gracie, who is right now very comfortable on his back. Naaman's doing a great job of what we call controlling his posture. He's breaking his posture down, taking his legs out away from with those great fights at times. So there's not a whole lot of power that Jason Jackson can bring, even if he tries to strike right now. And really, he's trying to control his balance because Naaman bringing those arms up higher and higher. You see how Jason Jackson's arms are getting over the top of his head. That could be a problem for him as far as his body. Keep your fingers away from his eyes. Referee admonishing Jackson, telling him to keep his fingers away from Gracie's eyes. We've had enough fingers, and yeah. we've had enough eyes. What Jason's trying to do is he wants to bring that forearm over the top so he can create a frame to push Gracie's head away, which will break the hand. You got one minute, 20 seconds there, JJ. Stay in the guard. Don't let him get out. No mistakes here. Be smart. Let's go, guys. 
You can hear Damon Gracie talking to him underneath. Talking to each other. Yeah, he continues to control Jackson's, Jackson's posture and the clock ticks away. Under a minute left in the third. Bigger four around the legs. Both of them So right now you've got Jason Jackson is stuck. He's on the top position. But he's unable to advance anything. He's unable to actually do a whole lot of posture because he's using his arms as his balance wings and his legs. Gracie looking for the reversal. He's going to get it. Nice job by Jason Jackson to keep that from happening right now. He's looking, listening to his corner with that wizard punch. And he, can't, he can't be offensive. Because he's defending against the reversal. Final 15 seconds of this welterweight matchup. And a tough night at the office for Jason Jackson. First with that self inflicted eye injury and well, being controlled by Naaman Gracie. How do you score it on the unofficial Woo! big John McCarthy scorecard? I have the fight basically 29-28. It's uh, no doubt in my mind that Naaman Gracie should walk away as the winner of this fight. What? It was just a strange fight, more or less, yeah. let's be honest. There's, things happened in that that I think changed the course oh, of the shit. fight. And it's nobody's fault. I want this shit. I want this shit, man. I want this shit. I want this shit. <laughs> So Jackson and Gracie now await the judge's verdict. What about the strategy employed by Gracie down the stretch? You know, down the stretch, if you're looking at what name and Gracie, he was, he was fighting his normal fight. He was trying to force him into the fence and get his body locked so he'd go into his takedowns. You know, the strikes landed, or it's, again, it's a little odd based upon things that happened in the first round, but he landed more strikes. You know, overall, the ground control is very close, but 38 kicks landed to 11. Naaman Grace well, is you, the guy that I'm saying. Yeah, and he continues fight. to, um, you know, the stand-up, a lot more uh, He's a lot more striking. He's a lot more comfortable than you'll see a lot of people, you know, with the Gracie name being. Yes, sir. Ah, another one. Yes. Your, your shorts is too big, bro. Oh, yeah? Yeah, every time I try to put in. Nah, man, my hand was wrapped up. My hand was wrapped up in this shit. Like, thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. You're great. Damon, right here? All right, let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your judges' scorecards where all three judges, Sal D'Amato, Michael Bell, Eric Colon, all see it exactly the same, 29 to 28. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision, the ass-kicking machine, Jason Jackson. Yes! Jason Jackson overcoming early adversity and recording the victory.
as he continues his uh, winning ways here in Bellator MMA as he just added Naaman Gracie to the list, his winning streak, including victories over Gracie. Vincent Henderson, Jordan Meehan, Kichi Kudimoto, and well, let's, uh, let's go to big John McCarthy. Jason Jackson, get over here, mister. What are you doing? <laughs> Congratulations on a very hard fought win, but it was a strange fight. What occurred in that first round when your face touched the chain link what did you feel what did you experience i felt my eyelid roll back and the whole thing scraped all the way down to the bottom of the cage it was just all blood i didn't know what to i didn't know if i wanted to give up and then i thought about it. i don't want 60. i want the whole thing so i just survived man i ain't come here to do all this hard work just to give up on myself and my family and everybody that's watching in jamaica my corner from stanford i, I wasn't gonna give up on my team did you have any type of vision problems based upon that injury against the cage? I had one eye when I got up and started oh. striking him. He hit me with a good shot, but I didn't see it. I was like, man, we got to do jab for jab and just stick with it. But I didn't get my vision back into the third round. Well, I'm taking a look at the leg kicks that you landed, especially that low calf kick and your jab. Might have been the difference in, that, in this fight. Was that something you said, I'm just going to go back to what I'm being successful with? Yes, I was planning on coming stingy in this fight. Just, you know, use the jab, just jab, jab to when I get tired, and that's what I did. Well, I want to tell you, congratulations. That is a big victory. Who would you want next? Tell me quick. Well, I think I'm, I, I'm next for the belt, so I don't know who I want next as a champ, obviously. Whoever win, whenever they defend the champ, I want the champ. And who don't feel like I, I should get the champ, we could fight. Sounds good to me. Congratulations on a big win for you. Jason Jackson, your winner. Jason Jackson with a four-fight winning streak now. And yeah, a very uh, bizarre fight tonight involving Naaman Garth Gracie as we go back to Jen Brown. All right, thanks, Mara. Well, tonight's fights are so nice, you can watch them twice. All right, if you miss any part of this evening's fine action, Bellator MMA Pitbull versus Sanchez 2, where we'll play on Showtime Saturday at 9 a.m. and Monday at 10 p.m. on Showtime Extreme. All right, it is just about time for the main event of the evening. We are live in Uncasville, Connecticut, here at the Mohegan Sun Arena. The champ champ, Patricio Pitbull, is about to put his belt on the line in a highly anticipated rematch with Emmanuel Sanchez. All right, when we talked to Patricio this week, he said, where I've improved most since 2018, that first matchup, he says, it's my striking. He also says it's my patience, Josh. How is that going to translate tonight? Well, I think the patience is going to translation is going to translate into him using his wrestling. He's going to try to control the tempo of the fight, and I think he's going to utilize his wrestling early and often. And the more takedowns he gets earlier, it's going to slow Emmanuel Sanchez down and not let him push him around, not let Emmanuel Sanchez dictate the pace of the fight, which is where he made the mistake in the first fight. This time around, he's going to utilize that wrestling. All right, AJ McKee, you are Patricio Pitbull right now. How do you get it done? If I was Patricio Pitbull fighting Emmanuel Sanchez, their first fight, the volume is key. So he needs to catch Sanchez getting zealous in these openings, catching him with combos while mixing it up, threatening him not only with the takedowns, but the counters off of Emmanuel Sanchez's punches. Emmanuel Sanchez has a tendency to not throw on his way out. And that's where Pitbull was catching him in the previous fight. So I'm looking forward to see what both these men have added to their arsenal. I've got a little bit of research. I know, I like, like his research. <laughs> hey, he's got to. He's facing the winner of tonight. Now, Emmanuel Sanchez said the biggest difference for him coming into this fight is his mindset. He says, I didn't know if I could beat Patricio Pitbull in the first fight. Now I do. Besides the change in mindset, Josh, what does Emmanuel Sanchez need to do to get it done tonight? He just really needs to fight a smart fight. He needs to do what he did against Daniel Weichel. He needs to pick and choose his shots, not rush in not leave himself open just like AJ said on top of that if the fight hits the ground he needs to focus on getting back not settling in his guard like he has done before where he's tried to hit submissions he needs to get back to his feet and start pushing the pace again don't get me wrong like AJ said earlier he's phenomenal off of his back but this is not where you want to give away rounds in a title fight with the potential of winning one million dollars to get to the finals to fight AJ McKee that is right all right well we are moments away so before we go I want to ask both of you predictions Josh? Why are you asking me? I'm right. going to fight the winner. AJ, <laughs> give it to AJ. Man, if I could have my cake and eat it too, um, I would pick Sanchez, you know? At, at that point, I've literally ran through the entire division. 
Um, so after that, Patricio Pitbull, he's still the 155 pound champ. He's the champ champ at the moment. These are accolades and things that I've said I wanted to conquer in my career. So for me, putting the icing on the cake is beating Sanchez, going for the 155 pound title. And you know, I've, I've constantly told Pitbull, I got that leash and kennel waiting for you whenever you're ready to go to the pound, baby. All right, well, Patricio Pipple told us that he believes that this is going to be one of the most violent fights of the year. And more if that's not a tease, I don't know what else is. Back down to you. All right, Jen, thank you very much. We are set for the final semifinal of the Featherweight Grand Prix. Patricio Pitbull, Emmanuel Sanchez. This is chapter two. Let's revisit what went down November 2018. November 15th, 2018, Tel Aviv, Israel. Patricio Pitbull, in his second title defense since regaining the Featherweight World Championship, defends his belt versus Emmanuel El Matador Sanchez. Here we go! 44 combined victories for Pitbull and Sanchez. I remember that it was a violent fight. Big right hand. Both of these guys, neither one likes to take a backward step. I know that uh, Dan here finished them in the first round. Whoa, he just got rocked with that, though. That hurt it. Manuel Sanchez needs to take his time here, keep the pressure, but don't rush in. Speaking humbly, with such a great fighter in front of me, I thought he'd be a lot harder to hit. And with all that power and all those highlights that he's got, I thought that he would hit harder. Manuel Sanchez still marching forward, throwing kicks, throwing punches, not giving an inch. You got to love this kid. And they swing hard. That was a big run. Both men beaten a little bit, bloody a little bit. Both men far from beaten. Emanos is very good. He's very dynamic. I like his style. But he is not better than me. Five minutes remain. This is the round, man. That title is on the line, in my opinion. Both guys can walk away with that belt. Oh, nice. Just combination left, right hand by Emmanuel Sanchez to start the round. Sanchez trying to hang on. That's smart fighting by him. Thank golden instance. He taught me a very valuable lesson that day, and now I'm looking forward to show him what he taught me. And still, Bellator featherweight world champion, Patricio Pitbull. He knows now I won the fight. This time I'm going to finish him at the beginning of the fight. I don't want you to do a war again. Uh, I knew that we were going to cross paths again. Next up, Patricio Pitbull. Will it be repeat or revenge for a spot in the Featherweight World Grand Prix Final? And now, ready to make his way to the cage, the challenger, Emmanuel and Matador Sanchez.
this way, the defending Bellator Featherweight World Champion, Patricio Pitbull. Bellator President Scott Coker called him the greatest fighter in Bellator history. Top pound for pound fighter in Bellator MMA's new rankings, a man who lords over two divisions. And we talked about it, John, with this walk, his 24th walk to the Bellator cage. That's a Bellator MMA record. This is his record 12th Bellator MMA title fight. He is a walking Bellator record breaker. He is exactly that. The one thing I will give the reporters that did the rankings, they got that one right. This is the guy, pound for pound, who is the best in Bellator right now. And this guy does it all. Super powerful strike. He's got the heavy hands, both hands. His keys to victory for this fight. He needs to make Sanchez pay when he enters into your range. Pitbull's become very good at just putting himself in the center and come to me. When he does come to you, I need you to counter and hurt him. Take him to the ground when you can. Don't make it where you're working hard for the takedowns, but when you can change levels when he comes in, get in there deep and bring him to the ground, bring him to the ground and damage him down there. Second simultaneous two division champion in Bellator MMA history. Also the lightweight kingpin, but tonight it's about the featherweight strap. It's about the featherweight Grand Prix. The winner will meet A.J. McKee in the $1 million championship final. Our tale of the tape for this featherweight championship fight and the right to go into the featherweight Grand Prix final. Look at the records, guys. 31 and 4 for Patricio Pitbull. He has been there and done it all, and 20 and 4. No one ever stopping either fighter. This should be fantastic. With the official introductions here once again is Michael C. Williams. Peloton MMA live on Showtime from Mohegan Sun Arena. The time has come to conclude the semifinal round of the Featherweight World Grand Prix. In tonight's main event, the rematch is now set for five five-minute rounds for the Bellator Featherweight World Championship. Sanctioned by the Mohegan Tribe Department of Athletic Regulation Chairman James Gessner, President of Sports and Entertainment Tom Cantone, and Supervising at Cage Side Director Mike Mazzulli. And now, first, introducing the Blue Corner. At five foot nine, weighing in 144.5 pounds. In his second challenge for the world title, he enters with 20 professional victories, four defeats, fighting out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the challenger, Emmanuel and Matador Sanchez. And across the cage, the champion fights out of the red corner. At five foot six, weighing in 144.1 pounds, the two weight class reigning world champion enters tonight with a veteran professional record of 31 victories, just four defeats, hailing from Natal Rio Grande do Norte, Brazil, presenting the defending Bellator Featherweight World Champion, Patricio Pitbull. And when the bell rings, the referee in charge, Todd Anderson. Gentlemen, we've gone over the rules in the back. Protect yourself at all times, obey my commands at all times. If you wish to touch gloves, do so now. Step back. From the fight sphere here at the Mohegan Sun Arena, we are set for the main event. It is for the Bellator MMA Featherweight Championship and a spot in the Grand Prix Final. The champion, Patricio Pitbull. The Ready? challenger, Emmanuel Ready? Sanchez. Ready? This is round number six. Round one of the rematch with the champion in the red gloves, Sanchez in the blue gloves. And remember in their first meeting in Tel Aviv, Israel, back in November 2018, John, Sanchez hurt Patricio Pitbull in the first round. Yes, he did, but you're seeing Pitbull do exactly what he looked. Look at, look at where he's at. He takes the center of the cage and then says, come to me. When you do, I'm going to counter you, and I'm going to hurt you. So Sanchez needs to be very smart in his application 
of when he decides to come into him, but he does need to make Pitbull work because if you're looking at the pace that we're seeing right now, this is well within Pitbull's range, and this is his world. Yes. Low cat kick there delivered by Sanchez, and kicks are a definite part of his recipe. Now, unlike their first beating, John, of course, the championship, it, I mean, Sanchez said it. Why do you become a pro fighter? It's to become a world champion. But not only is the belt at stake tonight, but that date with AJ McKee and that $1 million bonus check also at stake. But Pitbull right. basically said, I don't care about the money. Yeah, <laughs> it's, well, it's about the, the legacy, but it's always about the money, John. Of course it is. It's pride. But his fighting. pride is, if you're going to say what's more important to him, it's his pride. In his second reign as the featherweight champion, he blew away Michael Chandler in just 61 seconds to become the lightweight champion. Sanchez has reeled off three straight wins since pushing Pitbull to the limit in their first fight. The last time Pitbull lost was due to a leg injury. The only time he suffered a TKO, that was against Benson Henderson. Sanchez has never been stopped. Exactly, I refereed the fight, and it was, Pitbull was winning the fight. It, that was pretty clear. But there was an exchange where his leg ended up getting hurt. He tried to fight on it for a while. Finally said, I can't go anymore. And it was broken in half. Pitbull darts in with a combination, blocks that high kick by Sanchez, checks the low inside leg kick by Sanchez. A very measured and control attack by Sanchez and Pitbull. Both of them said they would be more measured. Absolutely. And both of them first on the scene, John Punch, different fighter. Oh my God, completely different. That was a very nice right hand yep. from the top by Pitbull. First of a three punch combination by Pitbull. There's the jab to the sternum. Chris striking the neck, catches Sanchez with the hook. And Pitbull pounces on Sanchez. Pitbull looking for that trademark guillotine. Jumps into the guard. That is tight. Pitbull looking for the guillotine choke. He's got that really tight right now. Sanchez is down. He's out. He's out. He's out. He's out. He's out. He is out. Pitbull becomes the first person to submit Emmanuel Sanchez, putting him to sleep. And Pitbull goes to the tournament final as a featherweight champion. And he will meet A.J. McKee as Pitbull gets it done in very quick fashion. He talked about that guillotine choke, and when he jumps to it, he does it because he knows he has that arm in place, and he knows that he's got to squeeze, and he's going to be able to finish the fight. He has done that multiple times in his career, and he has always come away with a submission victory. Nice left hand, right hand. The right hand doesn't hit the spot based upon the left hand moving Sanchez's body. But Pitbull lands a, that beautiful left. It puts Sanchez down, and as Sanchez tries to move himself to a position to try to get himself back to his feet, he leaves his neck under attack by Pitbull, and when he gets that arm in place again, it's that squeeze. He knows he has it, and you can see when he goes down and you see that foot of Sanchez being under the body, you know he's in trouble. And you see Pitbull try to tell him he's out. You can see Sanchez is not responding. He is definitely out at that point. The fight is over. A beautiful submission victory for the champion once again, Mr. Let's go, Jim Pitbull Ferrer. And Sanchez unable to protect his neck and despondent, disappointed, suffering his first loss inside the distance. And a great sign of sportsmanship there by the champion, Bellator featherweight kingpin, 
The pound for pound top dog is Patricio Pitbull. He has 12 submissions, half of them via guillotine choke. Hello. The man knows when he gets that arm in place, he knows what he's going to do. And that's so. who he will be meeting in the Grand Prix final. Undefeated, a Bellator MMA record winning streak, 17 and 0 for AJ McKee. The moment we've all been waiting for. And the talent you see on your screen right now, well, it can be seen from space. Patricio Pitbull, AJ McKee will battle to determine who will win the $1 million bonus check and who will be able to claim themselves the greatest featherweight. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially. Three minutes, 35 seconds into round number one by technical submission. He advances in the Featherweight World Grand Prix, and he is still Bellator Featherweight World Champion, Patricio Pitbull. Patricio Pitbull remains champ, champ, a proud Brazilian, paying respect. And he really just continues to rewrite the Bellator MMA record book, setting up a hellacious Grand Prix final. Let's go to Big John McCarthy. Patrice, Patricio Pitbull, that was a beautiful submission victory. But it was your control during the fight, your ability to take the center of the cage and just control the pace, shoot for counters. When you landed that big left hand, did you know he was that hurt? Yes, he's a great fight, but I was looking for the right moment, and I knew that he was coming to the, the wall, and I connect my best punch in his chin, and we go to the ground and I take his neck. Let's talk about the, the confidence you have in your guillotine. I believe that's your sixth guillotine submission victory, and we see you all the time. When you search for that guillotine, every time you jump to guard with it, you know that you have that locked in. Yeah, it's uh, like a normal movement for me. It's like in my veins, you know? It's just Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. That's a position I, I love very much. So he was there, I saw his neck, and that's it. Well, I would tell you, that was a beautiful win. Congratulations on being the very first person to ever stop Emmanuel Sanchez with a victory, taking him out of the fight. Congratulations on that. I'm gonna bring in your opponent coming up, Mr. A.J. McKee. AJ, you saw the performance, you saw the way that he took control of the fight, the power that's there. How are you gonna face this man? I told him I'm bringing that leash in the kennel, I'm ready to take him to the pound. Pitbull, AJ, take the center of the cage. Ladies and gentlemen, this is gonna be the finals of the Featherweight Grand Prix. There you have it, Patricio Pitbull will take on AJ McKee in the finals of the Featherweight Grand Prix and for the Bellator Featherweight World title. This is a fight that has been talked about for years and it is coming. It will be there for you. Pitbull versus McKee. You already lost. You will see that. You will see that. You will see that. To you be completed, you have to get the loss. You have to get loss for me. I took a loss in life. The verbal sparring has begun. The date with destiny still to come. Patricio Pitbull, AJ McKee. It doesn't get any better than the number one ranked challenger. A Bellator MMA record winning streak of 17. He is 17 and 0, and he takes on the featherweight champion, Patricio Pitbull, who showed up and showed out tonight. He was smoother than a fresh jar of Skippy, and I cannot wait for the $1 million Grand Prix final, Patricio Pitbull versus AJ McKee. Nuff said. But with the final word on the night, let's go to Jen Brown at the fight desk. 
Well, thanks, Mauro. Josh, you gotta you gotta love that. Uh, you know, he, our guest our guest analyst, you know, up here, you know, being very complimentary the whole night, and then gets some words in there at the end. It's funny how quick things can change. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> no, nice. the, the chatter itself is always common. I think that's great. They kept it professional. They're very, both of them are very professional. They understand what's at stake. It's a million dollars. Also, the title and the World Grand Prix title as well. They get two belts. That's what people need to understand. It's not just for the featherweight World Grand Prix belt, but it's also for the actual featherweight championship. As well as a million dollars. As well. You gotta add that little part in there. Okay, let's talk about the the, the the main event tonight. You talked about the game plan to beat Emmanuel Sanchez. It pretty much seems like Patricio followed that to a T. He let Emmanuel Sanchez come in, he caught him and, and got the guillotine. What did you think about that performance tonight? The patience was key. We talked about that all night. Even AJ was talking about him. He is patience because he is matured as a fighter. He's not someone that chases after your opponents. Look, if you want to be the king, as he says, you have to beat the king. That means you need to come to me, and I will go ahead and take your head off like a lion will. And that's exactly what he did. He pieced him up with the two-piece, dropped him down, and when he jumped on the, the neck, it worked. His arm and guillotine is probably the best in the business. And on top of that, though, what made that effective was the fact that it was in the first round and they were dry. Uh, 12 submissions, six of them are guillotine. I think that AJ McKee is going to need to look out for that. So let's talk about that matchup there. That is the finals. It is set. How do you think these two match up heading into what kind of fight are we going to expect between Patricio Pitbull and AJ McKee? Can the young lion take it over? Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. It comes down to can AJ McKee's talent and all the ability that people have talked about for years. Can he go in there and dethrone the lion? That's what he's got to do, the king. The guy's been at the top for the longest time. Can he go in there and do that? It's a tough task, but like Patricio said in the cage, a lot of people have talked and a lot of people have tried. Keep running your mouth and see what happens. This is what makes it exciting. I love the calm and composure of Patricio and with AJ McKee, the way he handles it as well. Very professional, but he understands that this is key. Like, this is the time for him to shine. All right. Well, lots to look forward to that fight later on this summer. All right. Great fight action tonight, and it keeps on going. Next weekend, Bellator MMA and Showtime Championship Boxing are back-to-back. -back. Friday, the light heavyweight World Grand Prix kicks off. Bellator heavyweight champ Ryan Bader goes head-to-head -head with Brazilian karate master Leota Machida, and it is a long-awaited rematch between two of the best in the world. And Saturday, it is Showtime Championship Boxing. Undefeated welterweight Jerron Ennis puts his perfect record on the line versus the former super lightweight champion Sergey Lipinets. It's next Friday and Saturday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 Pacific, only on Showtime. Coming up next, an encore episode of City on a Hill, Showtime's original dramatic series starring Kevin Bacon and Aldous Hodge. New episodes air Sundays at 10 p.m. All right, that does it for us up here at the Fight Desk. We'll be back here next week. Tomorrow, we're going to head back over to you. Get us off the air. All right, Jen, thank you so very much. Bellator 255, Bellator MMA's debut on Showtime started in the flyweight division. Alejandra Lara and Kana Watanabe with Kana Watanabe remaining undefeated. And then Usman Nurmagomedov in his much anticipated debut defeats Mike Hamill, improving to 12 and 0. Nurmagomedov, a fighter to watch at lightweight. Then the heavyweights ran it back. Tyrell Fortune battering Jack May until the referee stepped in. Fortune picks up the big win. And then in the co-feature, a pivotal matchup at welterweight. Naaman Gracie and Jason Jackson go the distance. Jackson injuring his left eye, but still able to overcome the adversity and hand Naaman Gracie the defeat. Jackson wins his fourth straight. And then the main event, the semifinals of the Featherweight Grand Prix. We had Patricio Pitbull submit Emmanuel Sanchez. And it will be Patricio Pitbull against AJ McKee in the Grand Prix Final. Thank you for watching Bellator MMA on Showtime.